right, so the uh, next uh, session is uh, thoracic outlet and upper extremity disease. Uh, Dr. Mark Matos is going to talk about TOS and upper extremity disease. Mark. Thanks, Will. Uh, good morning, everyone. We move from exciting aneurysms to thoracic outlet and upper extremity disease. So uh, let's see. There we go. So again, you guys know who I am from yesterday. So no disclosures, and so these are the acknowledgments. Again, all the talks are given by somebody else in earlier, and we build on them, which I think is a great idea. And those are some of the texts that I used, ones that you should be reading. So the question is, you're in clinic, right, and <clears throat> you're tired, and you go, how, somebody comes in with these vague symptoms, and your question and answer is, how do I approach the patient who might have TOS or an upper extremity disease? Well, I think you have to categorize how you think. Do you, is it acute versus chronic? Is it arterial venous or neurologic? Is it cardiac or non-cardiac in origin? Is it proximal or distal? Is it large vessel, small vessel? And you base it on etiology, anatomy, or pathology. You have to have a process in terms of how you evaluate those people rather than just read about it in a text and know numbers, right? You have to have, you have to use good clinical common sense because there are lots of etiologies, lots of categories. This comes from Rutherford. There are six categories and 38 etiologies for upper extremity arterial pathology. How many of you know all 38? Right. And you're in clinic and there's no textbook, right? Or you can base it on causes of ischemia, which there are 75 different causes. So upper extremity ischemia is really a mixed bag and you sort of have to have a sense of prioritize how you actually look at this and evaluate it. Let's start with thoracic outlet syndrome, defined there as compression of the neurovascular bundle at the thoracic outlet. The demographics are there. It's a very it's uncommon, typically 25 to 40, and women are 4 to 1 greater than men. Symptom distribution is primarily neurogenic. Secondary is venous and arterial running uh, far behind at 3% and 2% compared to 95% for the neurologic. What's the pathology and the pathophysiology? Well, you can get previous head trauma, low repetitive trauma, low repetitive movements, age-related postural changes, and you can get congenital variations of the three compression spaces, which is significant and uh, synonymous with uh, TOS. Some of the predisposing factors, cervical rib, a rudimentary first rib, elongated transverse process, congenital bands, narrowing of the costal clavicular space, sagging shoulders, or heavy breasts. All those people have come to my clinic with these problems over the last 25 years. And then this sort of talks about how and what happens of the three entities that run through the costal clavicular triangle, right? Vein, artery, and the nerve, and where the compression occurs. Okay, we have 15 minutes, so we really don't have time to go over that, but, but again, this is an hour lecture, very much detailed, talking about anterior scalene, subclavius muscle, the, ex, you know, the uh, pec minor, et cetera. Here's some more anatomy in terms of the scalene triangle, which is most common site for nerve compression, costocovelicular space, and the retropectoralis minor space. So how do I diagnose TOS? I need to have some pattern recognition in terms of how they approach. And they're going to come in with all sorts of symptoms, but you have to take a good history and do a good exam. Uh, and really, sometimes your diagnosis is one of exclusion, right? You have to exclude other problems to get to TOS. It's difficult. It's elusive. It can be progressively disabling. They're going to, you're probably going to be the 10th physician before they even get to you, right? They'll see 10 people. And you'll have all these different diagnoses. You'll get... They'll have partial or ineffective treatment from other people, and you're left with a final diagnosis. And by that time, they're ready to sue, right? They're ready to have some legal action because they are not getting any relief. And so you better do your job right and do it thorough when it comes time. But your overall clinical evaluation is pretty critical. Patients are frustrated. So some exasperating when you talk to them in terms of the diagnosis, that they get recurrence and re exacerbation of their symptoms when they raise their hands over their head when they reach for objects. I was at the University of Washington and I treated a couple 25-year-old women who were brushing their hair and developed effort vein thrombosis. Pretty interesting. Lifting, prolonged typing, driving, speaking on the phone, shaving or combing or brushing your hair. From a neurologic point of view, NTOS, it's a variable clinical pattern. 
It could be based on lower brachial plexus. It could be based on upper brachial plexus. And you need to know those nerve physical findings and signs and symptoms both. You can't be related to just one. You have to know both. How about VTOS, venous compression or obstruction? You can get swelling, edema, cyanosis. And VTOS is not always synonymous with Paget-Schroeder or effort vein thrombosis. You can get compression without thrombosis and swelling and significant dysfunction. You can get forearm fatigue and large subcutaneous collateral veins, sudden onset and symptoms. Uh, this is sort of an example of what happens. It's where this chronic repetitive injury, you get an early fibrosis, uh, and you get some circumferential perivenous scarring. Again, nothing showed up yet. Then you get these collaterals, and they have no symptoms, but it's only when the thrombus forms and exceeds the collateral abilities to take the vein blood flow back to the heart that you get symptoms. It can be slowly progressive, or it can be very acute. Here's an example of a venogram <clears throat> showing a uh, subclavian axillary vein thrombosis, somebody with uh, effort vein thrombosis. How about ATOS, arterial compression, digital or hand ischemia, continuous ulcerations or emboli, forearm claudication, it's worsened with arm elevation. You can get a pulsatile mass in the supraclavicular space, which represents a subclavian artery aneurysm, or post dilatation of the artery related to compression at the costoclavicular space. Uh, here's an example of an arteriogram which shows the dilation of the subclavian artery, which is obviously much bigger than the normal size, which is probably somewhere around 1 to 12 one ten to 12 millimeters in size. And then that's what it looks like in, with an open incision. So on exam, what are you trying to look for? Well, you want to focus on the neck, shoulder, arms, and hands, obviously, looking for a mass, looking for a brewery. Are they swollen? Do they have cyanosis? Are they blanching? discoloration of petechiae, because you have to exclude Raynaud's, you have to exclude a cardiac embolus, you have to exclude all, you know, intrinsic obstructive pathologies. Find a trigger point maybe on their anterior scalene, or, or you can actually do it at Herb's point, which is on the lateral border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle uh, and above the clavicle. Whoops. Uh-oh. Can we get that back on? What does that mean? Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> here's an example of somebody who comes into my clinic, and this is what they look like. What is this? Raynaud's, right? Pretty simple, but again, you have all three aspects, right? Blanching, reperfusion, right? Ischemia. Red, white, and blue. Go America. We'll be great. Um, so what are some of the provocative tests that originated? One was the Adson maneuver, uh, where you actually have the patient take a deep breath, turn their head to the ipsilateral side, and you get a loss of a pulse. Now, is this designed for our ATOS? No, it's designed to say that the space in the costal clavicular junction has been compressed with this maneuver. All right, this was the original uh, description by Adson in 1947. Uh, there's another, uh, here's another one as well, uh, just showing you what happens on inspiration. Your first rib gets elevated, the thoracic outlet space is compressed, and you lose your pulse. That's the, that's the etiology of it. You can do the rights test where it's the same thing, but you turn the head away and raise the hand upward. <clears throat> the stretching of the anterior scalene compresses, and the inspiration compresses the space, and you get loss of pulse. But you also might get replication of the neurologic symptoms as well as this way. You can also do the Roos or the East test, which is the elevated arm test, which is the surrender position where opening and closing their hands, their hands can become white or they can reproduce their symptoms. They can also have sagging of their arms. Most people should be able to hold their arms up for three minutes without dropping it. But if they begin to drop, there could be some arterial schema muscle weakness related to that. And that's other might also be significance in a synonymous with it. Again, this is if you want to do a plethysmography of the radio artery, you'll see that there's a loss of pulse in the right, which would indicate that this is a positive test for possible compression in the clavicular space. If you're looking for neurologic, you can do EMG and nerve conduction velocities, F-wave responses, somatocentury, and, but now you're getting into a system where this is what you do for a living is take care of TOS. My clinic, I don't have any of this stuff. I'd have to send them out. Now, Murray works in Southern in, uh, USF, and Carl Illich is very big in this. I don't know if Carl has all these things associated with that, but if, if this is what you want to do for the rest of your life, these are the things that you have to have. The differential, cervical spine disorder, neurologic orders, you have to make sure it's not cubital 
or carpal tunnel, if they have hand problems and musculoskeletal disorders. So the non-invasive testing you can do in your office in the lab, segmental pressures, flow detector, digital plethysmography. Here's an example of segmental pressures in the upper extremity. You can see that on the left that there's some problem uh, distally, not necessarily for TOS, but for upper extremity arterial ischemia. Okay, we've transitioned to now, maybe it's not TOS, but maybe it's something else going on. Do your digital plethysmography to check your waveforms. Understand that Raynaud's has a different waveform than obstructive pathology than, a, than normal pathology. You can also look in your lab with ultrasound, basically looking at the anatomic finding, looking at flow patterns, presence of stenosis or thrombus. You want to rule out a cervical rib by getting a chest x-ray or an elongated transverse process. Here's an example of a duplex showing axillary vein thrombosis next to the artery and subclavian artery compression if you have a good lab. Again, getting to the diagnosis. You get a chest x-ray. On the left is your cervical rib, and on the right is no cervical rib, but the transverse process is elongated, and that could be causing some of the neurologic symptoms. So you have to pay attention on these people on the x-ray. Don't rely only on the radiologist. Put your eyes on the x-ray and take care of business yourself. Diagnostic anatomic study, CTA, MRI, MRV. Again, looking for patency, stenosis. You're doing dynamic views at neutral, AB abduction, extension, and looking for compression of the space. Same thing with arteriography and angiography. Here's an MR angiography for ATOS, and you can see that uh, right here there is an area of narrowing, and that when he raised his hand up, similar to the east, that you get some narrowing right there. Venography, same way, you look like you have localized thrombus in the subclavian vein here. Doing an aortic arch run, you can see that that subclavian artery is not normal. It looks like there's some postodontic dilatation. We know that angiography, you can't tell. And diagnose an aneurysm, just all you can tell is that there's something different about the intraluminal flow in the artery. You need a more uh, a CT or an MRI to show you the entire picture. Sitting up, just lying down, you can see that sometimes there'll be a difference in terms of your arch angiogram. Aortic arch angiogram for somebody who has trauma, again, not just TOS, but anybody who comes with an ischemic upper arm, again, you can see that there's disruption of the axillary brachialary artery. How about giant cell arteritis as somebody who comes into your office, has a history of that, has some ischemia? You know, this is different than Takiasu's, right? A giant cell is axillobrachial, and Takiasu's is a nominate subclavian and tends to be more proximal. Knowing that that difference between the two will be helpful in your diagnosis of these people. These are not easy people to diagnose. It seems simple I'm giving this talk, but they are not easy. You're going to have to go through your checklist, which means you have to do your reading, which means you have to have a, a, a good knowledge base, right? You have to understand that. Positional angiography, it shows here, arm neutral, arm adducted. Selective angiography, if you're not, if somebody has distal hand ischemia, you can't leave your catheter in the subclavian artery and think you're going to get a good view. You have to go down to the brachial artery. You have to use nitroglycerin or priscaline or papaverin, and you got to dilate those vessels to get a good idea about what your distal forearm and your hand is, right? You've got to turn them into a neutral position. Here's somebody presented with distal ischemia, gangrene to that toe, and you can see that there's a loss of flow in some of the digital arteries. But I had to dilate that up with nitroglycerin. And then you got this patient who look, has an abnormal look in terms of the ulnar artery, all right? So this is an ulnar artery aneurysm, hypothenar and hammer syndrome, the most frequent, or the, actually the largest databases at the University of Oregon that was started by John Porter uh, and, uh, uh, in the early 70s, um, and they used to report on that all the time. Um, venous TOS, sometimes you have to do upper extremity retrograde venogram. And you can either cannulate the basilic vein, which is better than the cephalic, because what happens with the cephalic, you'll miss the basilic, you'll miss the brachial. Or you do ultrasound guided access of the brachial vein, and you shoot your venogram. And here it just shows some thrombus in two areas here where the red dots are. You can do a positional venogram. If, you're, if somebody has symptoms that you're worried about VTOS, but it's not showing up on the venogram, change the position of the arm. Here we had them compress against their side, and you can see that the cephalic and the brachial veins are compressed by the pec major muscle, all right? These are not straightforward cases. Here's an axillo subclavian vein compression without thrombus with somebody who presented with arm swelling. And again, let's go over some questions. I think we have some time. Let's go, this comes out of VCEP3, right? 
So read that question. We'll give you 15 seconds. You're going to have to read fast. Here's the question. What's the answer? Somebody speak up. Evan. 10 seconds. D. All right. What was the diagnosis? It's a hypothenar hammer syndrome. Right? Where do you get the artery from or the bypass? It could be from the basilic, cephalic, or you could use a dorsalis pedis artery if you need to. It's one thing, or just not a vein artery, but there's a dorsalis vein, pedis vein, all right? There's the incision, there's what it looks like, intranormal thrombus. Let's go to another one. 32-year-old woman with pain and paresthesia. She had a brachial embolectomy because she got ischemic. Um, Post-op day two, she, you get a call from, and she's ischemic. Chest x-ray shows it below. What's, which of the following is the most appropriate? Speak up. Anyone? Any of them? Me? Yep. What does she have? No, but what does she have? There you go. Thank you. Next one. 30 seconds. Come on. This is all we give you in our VSAT review if you come to Flint. You get 30 seconds. That's it. All right. Question is, what's the diagnosis on this lady? Oh, <laughs> gave you the answer. <laughs> Sorry, that one, that's not the way it's supposed to be. Everybody agree with that? Yeah, okay. Next one. Who do I know in there? Can... Gentleman in the green hat and the boots. So you must be from Texas. So what's your answer? <laughs> Residence from Geisinger. Fellow from Geisinger. What is it? All right. We agree with that. Murray shaking his head. Will. D. What's the diagnosis? Calciphylaxis. Excellent. All right, next question. I got one more. I got to get going, so get Maria's time. <laughs> Anybody? Just give me an answer so I can get off the podium. <laughs> So last, so no symptoms of effort fatigue or posterior circulation ischemic. T. Option. And let's see, we should get off. So never mind. Good. Thank you guys.